So I'm really excited to be here today, and I'm going to talk to you about something that you use every day, but you probably don't think much about. Now, to demonstrate, I brought some props, and I'm going to ask a few of you to help me by catching them. Okay, so I'm going to throw them now. Start over here. Okay, and then towards the middle. This direction. All right, so for those of you who got to catch a ball, of course you had to think about it, but you also had to use your muscles. But have you ever considered how your muscles actually work? Why can you actually move your arms and your legs? And what might go wrong that would actually cause your muscles to stop working? So in other words, what would cause a muscle disease? Our bodies have more than 650 different muscles. They are located in different positions, and they have different functions. So for example, to catch the ball, you had to use muscles in your arms as well as in your hand. Everyone was able to actually track where those balls were going because muscles control where your eye moves and what you can see. And the whole while, your heart was pumping, keeping you alive. So our bodies have multiple different kinds of muscles that contract in different ways and that have different functions. But what actually is a muscle? So let's take, for example, just our bicep. So what we consider a muscle actually can be broken down into multiple smaller parts. So a muscle is built of multiple fibers, and each of those fibers is in turn built of something called a myofibril. Each myofibril, in turn, is built of something called a sarcomere. Sarcomeres are the mini motors, the little machines that let your muscles contract. So the myofibril and the sarcomere are the basic, smallest units that you can look at for a muscle. And like I just said, the sarcomere is actually, it's a motor, it's a molecular motor. So what does a biological motor look like? At the simplest level, it consists of two things, actin and myosin. The actin filaments are anchored in the Z discs, while the myosin is anchored in the middle in the M line. Now, myosin is actually a motor. It can reach out and it can grab actin and pull on it. So this looks something like this. The myosin reaches out and it walks and grabs and pulls on the actin. Now, because the actin is anchored in these Z-discs, this causes the Z-discs to move closer to each other. This is what actually causes your muscles to contract. Sarcomeres, of course, don't consist of just one molecule of actin and myosin, but thousands of molecules of actin and myosin, all alive, um, arrayed parallel to each other. So this is what generates the force that allows you to move. But we just talked about that we have different kinds of muscle. If all muscles are built of the same small motor unit, how do you actually have arms that contract like an arm and a heart that pumps like a heart? This would be similar to the comparison, for example, between a smart car and a Porsche. Now, a smart car is actually, it's very useful. You know, they're tiny, they can fit into small parking spaces in the city, it's great. But if you want a car that has higher performance, it's going to drive a lot faster when you're driving on the highway, you're probably going to choose the Porsche. And of course, one of the differences between those two cars is in their motor, is in the engine. So maybe if we want to understand the difference between different types of muscle, we need to look a bit closer at the motor, at the sarcomeres. So sarcomeres don't consist of just actin and myosin. They consist of multiple other proteins. So one of these proteins, these components that build the sarcomere is called titan. Titan is a huge component. It spans all the way from the Z disk to the M line. It's thought to be a ruler that helps set how big the sarcomeres are going to be. It also has a spring region, and that spring is going to determine how the muscle is able to actually contract, how that sarcomere can move. It's not just titan. There are actually hundreds of other components that build a sarcomere that influence where things are going to attach, how they're going to work, that actually make this whole structure stable. So different types of muscles can actually put different components in their sarcomeres to get different functions. And to some extent, they do this. But a sarcomere is a sarcomere. You know, you, you can't exchange an actin for something else. And so the way that muscles solve this problem is they express different versions 
of the same component. What do I mean by that? So this is Titan, that long component I introduced. There's actually different versions of Titan. So there's one up here on the screen that's very long. It's a very long, flexible spring. There's other versions that are very short, short and stiff. So you can imagine that something that's a very long, flexible spring is going to have a very different contraction property than something that's very short and stiff. So how does a cell actually go about building different versions of the same thing? They do this by a process called alternative splicing. And this is just a very simple explanation of what that is. So this is a sentence. We can divide it into four parts. Let's eat, comma, grandma. Now, if we just take the sentence at face value, we have a nice picnic with our grandmother. But if we splice the sentence, it has a very different meaning. <laughs> now, this is the concept of alternative splicing. You reorganize the components to get different versions. This is exactly what happens in a biological context. So our DNA basically stores all of our genetic information, all of the genes. And those genes are stored as units. Now, for a cell, when it decides it wants to make one of those genes, first it has to make a blueprint. And in that blueprint, which is called an RNA molecule, there are regions in between the different units that have to get removed. So there's a molecular scissors that comes, and it actually cuts the RNA. Those intervening sequences get removed, and the remaining units get joined together. Now, this is a readable blueprint that the cell can actually turn into a protein. For example, one of the components of the sarcomere, or Titan. Now, if the molecular scissors cut in different locations, what ends up happening is alternative splicing. Sometimes it even cuts in the middle of an existing unit. And this is how you actually generate the different versions of the exact same gene. Now, what I actually study in my lab are the regulators of this process. The regulators are things that actually tell the molecular scissors where they should cut or where they shouldn't cut. So they determine all of the alternative splicing in the cell, and ultimately which specific versions of proteins are actually expressed in which different type of muscle. Why do we care about this? Because different muscles, of course, express different versions of proteins. So for example, your leg muscle, your soleus, it expresses very long, flexible isoforms of Titan. This lets you move. Your heart, on the other hand, expresses very short, stiff isoforms of Titan. This is very important for your heart to actually be able to pump blood through your body. If you look in patients who have heart disease, a heart disease called dilated cardiomyopathy, what you find is that their hearts, which normally should have these short, stiff forms of Titan, now have very long, flexible, even longer than normal versions of Titan. Because the heart isn't stiff enough, this leads to heart attacks. It can even lead to death. So on the simplest level, the sarcomeres are broken. It's not just heart disease. There's many other diseases that are associated with defects in alternative splicing. So I actually generated this word cloud actually from published papers that are linking defects in splicing in muscle with different diseases. You can see a lot of things represented here, everything from muscular dystrophy, and cancer to spinal muscular atrophy. And a lot of these diseases are actually associated with defects in the regulators of alternative splicing. Now, our genomes, our DNA, or that of a mouse, actually encodes more than 1,000 different possible regulators for alternative splicing. Of those, just under 700 of them are actually expressed in muscle. We know the function of 34. So all of those diseases come from the study of 34 genes. That means there are more than 600. We don't know what they do. That's why I study alternative splicing in muscle, to try to understand you know, what these guys do, and if maybe there's actually more diseases associated with defects in splicing that we just don't know about. So how do you go about identifying a function for more than 600 genes? Sounds kind of like a big job. Enter the fruit fly. So yes, these are the guys that you see buzzing around the overripe bananas in your kitchen. And yes, they are good for more than target practice. So 
Just like us, flies have different behaviors. They can jump or they can fly. These behaviors require different types of muscles. So if we look at a fly, they actually have hundreds of different muscles in their little bodies. So their muscles function actually very similar to how our own muscles function. They have muscles in their heads that let them eat, muscles in their bodies and in their legs that let them move. Um, and here in red, you can see the flight muscles. These are the muscles that let them fly. Now, if we put these muscles under a microscope so we can actually see what they look like, we can see they look very different from each other. So the muscles in their legs or their body muscles, all the sarcomeres are actually aligned with each other. It has a very different structure than what we find if we look in the flight muscles. The flight muscles are actually the power horse muscles of the fly. They can contract up to 300 hertz. That's more than 300 times per second. The leg muscles don't contract nearly that fast, but their function actually allows the fly to move. Now, as a biologist, this is actually really cool. I have a really simple organism, and I have very different types of muscle. So I can actually start to do some experiments now to understand how those muscles work and how we get different types of muscle. Now, if somebody were to hand you a motor from a car and ask you how it works, you might start to figure that out by, for example, removing that part there. Okay, using genetics, we can do that same thing in a fly. So we can just take that part of the sarcomere out right there. Now, you might call this a modified engine. We call this a mutant fly. And yes, that is mutants like in the X-Men, with the exception that our flies usually don't develop superpowers. I'm not a mechanic, but I'm pretty sure if you remove that belt, the motor's not going to work. And that's exactly the question that we're asking with our flies. If we take that component out of the sarcomere, does it still work? And because we're working with flies, we have a very easy way to find out if it works or not. So we take our flies, and we simply dump them in the top of a one-meter-long cylinder. Now, if those flies can fly, they land at the top. If their muscles don't work anymore, they fall to the bottom. So that gives us two types of flies, flyers and non-flyers. And then we can actually put the muscles under a microscope and see what they look like. So this is what the muscles, the flight muscles in a normal fly look like, these ones right here in the middle of the thorax. You see these nice big muscles that extend all the way from one end of the thorax to the other, and they basically fill the whole thorax space. Now, what do the muscles look like in one of those mutant flies that can't fly? With the one particular mutant I'm showing you, you can actually see that the muscles are ripped. They're torn. They no longer fill the thorax. In fact, they've started to atrophy and they've started to die. It's no wonder that these flies can't fly because they don't have any muscles left. Now, this might seem like something very simple. I'm just showing you an example of one mutant. But with flies, the thing that's really cool is that you can actually do this for many, many, many different genes. So this has been done genome-wide for more than 10,000 different genes. You can't do that in a human or in a mouse. Okay, so this is what happens when you make a mutation in one sarcomere gene. But if you remember, what I actually study are the regulators. Regulators can bind more than one RNA. That means they can bind the RNAs from multiple different genes. So when we make a mutation in a single regulator, what ultimately ends up happening is that we get many different genes in the sarcomere or throughout the entire muscle cell that are actually mutant. Okay, this is what makes a lot of human muscle diseases very difficult to study. It's not just one thing going wrong. It's tens or hundreds of things that are going wrong. The power of flies is that because their muscles work very similar to ours, we can actually start to examine, okay, the regulator I'm showing you here happens to be a gene called Bruno1. And actually, that sarcomere gene mutant, the single one, it happens to be one of those Xs, just one of the targets of Bruno that's regulated. So we can actually go into the system and understand piece by piece which of the things that are going wrong actually contribute to the disease and to the failure of the muscle to possibly identify how we might treat that or how we might fix it. Okay, so I've shown you that Bruno actually causes muscle disease in flies. We have the same genes in our bodies, but it has the name of self-1. 
And just like Bruno causes muscle disease in flies, misregulation of self-1 causes disease in humans, a disease called myotonic dystrophy. So by studying flies, we can really understand what goes wrong in a muscle disease in our own bodies. And it's not just Bruno. There are at least 10 other genes that cause disease in muscle disease or disrupt muscles in flies that also cause muscle disease in humans. So flies are really a great model for us to understand what these genes do and how they work. Um, experiments that you really can't do on humans. And I want to leave you with a thought that there's still a lot to learn. We still have more than 600 different regulators, regulators to characterize to figure out what they do in muscle and how they work. And fruit flies provide a great model, a great way for us to do that and to understand what alternative splicing does that controls muscle development and how, when you misregulate it, you get muscle disease. So this is why I spend my days studying fruit flies. And I hope that the next time that you see a fruit fly buzzing around your kitchen, you don't look at it quite the same way again. <laughs>